Thank you, Simon, for that introduction. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, kia ora. It's an honor and pleasure to address the China Business Summit again. First, I want to acknowledge NZ Inc. and the Auckland Business Chamber for hosting this event. And thank you, Fran and Simon, for your kind invitation. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the Prime Minister for his very important keynote speech, which speaks to not only the importance of the bilateral relationship, but to some of the approaches we might adopt towards conducting that all-important relationship going forward. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, uh, Minister O'Connor and Senator Ayres uh, for their important comments. Not long ago, uh, Prime Minister Chris Hipkins led arguably the largest ever delegation, trade or otherwise, to China. And many guests present here today joined this successful visit. As a new milestone in China-New Zealand relations, the Prime Minister's visit was productive and fruitful. I was privileged to accompany the delegation throughout their journey in China and would like to share with you three of my deepest impressions. The first impression to share is that visit has again showcased the broad consensus reached by the two countries at the highest level on the continued development of the bilateral relationship. Since the inception of our diplomatic ties, Successive leaders of both countries have established a clear common understanding that a healthy, stable, and thriving bilateral relationship is in our mutual interest. This conception of the relationship was reaffirmed and amplified during the visit, as manifested in the joint statement from the two governments on further developing our comprehensive strategic partnership. More importantly, as you can tell from the enthusiasm shown towards the outcomes of this visit in wide areas, ranging from mutual understanding and trust to trade and broader economic links to science and technology, education, agriculture, and finally, to people-to-people -people exchanges. The mutually beneficial practical cooperation between us enjoys broad-based support in both countries. Notably, the visit was well received and widely covered by the media in both countries, which is yet another indication of the intense interest in and the solid foundation for our partnership. All this gives me confidence in the future of our relationship, for there is no better guarantee than combination of high-level stewardship participation from the business communities and support from the public for a productive and enduring relationship going down the road. The second impression I want to share is that our comprehensive strategic partnerships keeps evolving and brings tangible benefits to our two countries and particularly our two peoples. In Tianjin, I joined the Prime Minister and the rest of the delegation on a visit to a local supermarket and witnessed the level of penetration by New Zealand businesses and products on the Chinese market and the extent to which these products, including but not limited to kiwi fruits, dairy and meat and wines, have made their way into the homes of Chinese, ordinary Chinese people. In Shanghai, Tourism New Zealand and Xiao Hongshu a lifestyle sharing platform immensely popular among the younger generation of Chinese consumers launched a partnership reflecting and building upon the appeal of New Zealand tourist offerings among Chinese travelers. These examples are just a microcosm of the close cooperation between our two countries. For years, the two sides have been taking advantage of the complementarities between us to make the pie of common interests bigger, with our bilateral trade exceeding $40 billion last year. Behind these headline figures, it is jobs 
and incomes for New Zealand and New Zealanders, and also high quality products and services brought to large numbers of consumers in China, which have benefited the socioeconomic development of both countries and demonstrated the mutually beneficial nature of our win-win cooperation. My third and final impression to share is that our comprehensive strategic partnership has great potential and vast room for further growth. During the visit, President Xi Jinping, Premier Li Qiang, and Chairman Zhao Leji of MPC Standing Committee met with Prime Minister Hipkins, and the leaders from both sides reiterated the commitment to further strengthening our bilateral relationship, in particular, to expanding practical cooperation to unlock its full potential. While promoting cooperation on trade in traditional sectors, the leaders also agreed to set our sight on exploring opportunities in e-commerce, trade in services, green economy, and the Maori economy. In this connection, many Kiwi businesses signed or renewed agreements or contracts with the Chinese partners during the visit covering areas of dairy, meat, fruits, pet food, health, personal care, hotels, and sustainable development. Examples include the reinstatement of the Guangzhou Christchurch direct flights, the strategic cooperation between Comvita and China Resources Vanguard supermarkets, between New Zealand-owned Swiss Bell Hotel International and CTG Hotel Group in China, and between Tourism New Zealand and Xiaohongshu as I've mentioned earlier. In addition, multiple intergovernmental instruments were signed in areas of science, in technology, education, agriculture, forestry, quarantine, food safety, and intellectual property rights, providing the institutional framework for relevant cooperation in future. Thanks to the focus of attention and the face-to-face -face encounters made possible by the visit, the people and business communities of the two countries have got to know each other better, gaining a deeper understanding of and greater confidence in the opportunities and potential of our cooperation ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, during the visit, the Chinese leaders also briefed the Prime Minister on China's development path, as well as the resolve and measures to implement the new concept of development featuring openness, innovation, coordination, sustainability, and inclusiveness to accelerate reform and opening up and to realize high-quality development. This brings me to another topic I'm keen to share with you today, the outlook for China's development and the opportunities it generates for the rest of the world which powers at a foundational level the long-term growth of China-New Zealand partnership. In China, we believe that the path a country chooses for its development cannot and should not be divorced from its own history and tradition. Otherwise, it will lose its roots and thus its identity and direction. Equally importantly, it must keep abreast of the trends of the time. While staying in the bubbles of a bygone era might give people a false sense of comfort or security, it will not solve their problems, nor will it enable them to grasp the opportunities of the present, let alone to embrace the future. For China, the central task in the decades ahead is unquestionably to advance what we call the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation through the Chinese path to modernization. Deeply rooted in the fine traditional Chinese culture, the Chinese path to modernization also draws on the best of civilizations across the world. Admittedly, today's world is undergoing momentous changes. These are driven firstly and fundamentally by leaps and bounds in science and technology which have been transforming patterns of production, social administration, and interpersonal communications, as traditional monopolies falter and new industries and products emerge. 
Like it or not, tectonic shifts are taking place in international relations as well. With the rise of a number of developing or emerging market countries and the evolutions in the rules and architecture for global governance. Not all changes are for the better, though, given the rising anti globalization sentiments and moves to decouple or break originally efficient and robust supply chains in the name of security or resilience, we see in different parts of the world particularly in some of the one-time alleged champions of free trade and global cooperation. On top of that, the clock is ticking on some of the common challenges we face as humankind, such as climate change that requires urgent, coordinated collective actions. Against the background of these profound transformations for which China is both a stakeholder and in some cases a driver, the Chinese path to modernization we have charted for ourselves features increasing reliance on endogenous innovation as a major driver for growth. It also requires continued opening up and integration with the rest of the world. Just as President Xi Jinping puts it, only an open China can become a modernized China. Essential to our approach to the modernization drive, China also follows a peaceful road to development. As we have made it clear multiple times, we do not seek to outcompete, unseat, or challenge anyone. Our sole purpose is to enable our own people to live better and fulfilling lives just as any responsible government will, do, will seek to do for its own people. And we're willing to share the benefits and opportunities of our development with other countries in the world and contribute to addressing global challenges on the basis of mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. For all that has happened, China, like most countries, still believes that openness, integration, and cooperation rather than exclusion, division, or military blocks and confrontation is the way to go for our deeply interconnected world. At the same time, there shouldn't be any doubt that it will resolutely safeguard our sovereignty and territorial integrity and legitimate security and development interests, including, in particular, our right to development. Again, just as any sovereign and independent country, including New Zealand, will do. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past decade, China has been an important source of growth for the world economy, with its economy growing at 6.2% on average annually, contributing over 30% of global growth. In the middle of a global slowdown, China stands out as a large economy with stable and robust economic performance and low inflation. This year, confidence in the Chinese market has picked up with a strong rebound in consumption and investment. The economy grew by 4.5% in the first quarter, and in a matter of hours, the latest statistics will be announced for the second quarter and not in a position to jump the gun, but the general expectation is that growth in the second quarter will pick up considerably as compared to quarter one. And retail sales in May grew by 12.7% over the same period last year. And trade shows its re resilience with a year-on-year -year increase of 2.1% of total goods, imports, and exports in the first half of this year. And the figures released by the UN indicate that incoming FDI into China defied the general trend of a 12% drop globally and grew by 5% in 2022, a remarkable vote of confidence by the global investor community in the long-term prospects for growth in China. And the momentum has continued in the first half of 2023, as evidenced by the visits to China by the heads 
of some of the leading multinational corporations in the world. The international community remains optimistic about China's economy for this year. The World Bank lifted its prediction of China's growth for this year to 5.6%, while the IMF expects China's economy to expand by 5.3%. In the short run, China's economy might encounter some headwinds as a result of internal and external factors, especially efforts by a small number of countries at containing and suppressing China's development through extensive coercive measures, including trade and investment restrictions, and decoupling and breaking of supply chains. They sometimes call it de-risking now, which is at worst a fig leaf for decoupling, or at best a very slippery slope towards more or less the same results in increased fragmentation, lower efficiency, less resilience, weaker growth, and greater rather than smaller risks for the world as a whole and all countries that rely on a functioning open global economy. In the long run, however, the strength, resilience, and potential of the Chinese economy remains unchanged as the fundamentals sustaining its long-term sound development remain unchanged. As the second largest economy, the biggest merchandise trading country, and one of the biggest consumer markets in the world, China will open its door wider and integrate itself deeper into the world economy. China has realized its development in the process of globalization and remains firmly committed to free trade openness, integration, and cooperation within the framework of an open, rules-based, and non-discriminatory multilateral trading system. We currently have a 400 million strong middle-income community, which is expected to double to 800 million by 2035, bringing about a supersized market open for the whole world. We have a full-fledged manufacturing sector featuring whole production chains, continued urbanization and industrialization for decades to come will remain powerful engines for further growth. More importantly, the innovation-driven innovation development approach has accelerated industrial transformation so that China leads the world in an increasing number of areas like EVs, high-speed railway, new energy, and new materials. With these favorable conditions, China is well-placed to overcome the difficulties and challenges to sustain mid to high growth rates well into the future and realize robust and high quality development. Ladies and gentlemen, the growing relationship between China and New Zealand over the past 50 years has amply demonstrated that our common interests far outweigh our differences, that, are, that we are each other's friends and partners rather than rivals, opportunities rather than threats. Both countries pride ourselves on an independent foreign policy. Both oppose confrontation, conflicts, and being forced to choose sides. We share a commitment to free trade and an open world economy. The international system with the United Nations at its core and the international order based on the international law. And both stand ready to work with others to maintain international and regional peace and stability and promote common development and prosperity. We both support international cooperation to address common global challenges such as climate change and support our Pacific Island partners in their pursuit of sustainable development. All these showcase the significant commonality we share and serve as the fundamental reason why our two countries, by working together, can and will bring more certainty to the world. This year marks the opening of the second 50 years of our bilateral relations, and 2024 will mark the 10th anniversary of the establishment of the comprehensive strategic partnership between the two countries. Just as President Xi Jinping emphasized during his meeting with Prime Minister Hipkins, 
China has always regarded New Zealand as a friend and partner. No matter how the international landscape may evolve, our commitment to developing friendly relations with New Zealand has not and will not change. It is no surprise that there are differences between our two countries. Given the differences in our respective circumstances, there is no inevitability, though, that countries with differing social systems and levels of development cannot coexist peacefully and cooperate productively. Indeed, as reaffirmed again at the highest level during the Prime Minister's visit, both sides refuse to allow the differences between us to define our relationship. Building on what we have achieved together through hard efforts and based on the principle of equality and mutual benefit, the principle of seeking commonality while managing constructively and transcending our differences through dialogues rather than megaphone diplomacy, the principle of non-interference in each other's internal affairs, and above all, the principle of mutually beneficial cooperation. So on the basis of these principles, China stands ready to work with New Zealand to implement the latest consensus reached between our leaders during the Prime Minister's recent visit and progress further our comprehensive strategic partnership to bring more benefits to the countries, to the two countries and peoples and make greater contribution to world peace and development. Finally, I wish the China Business Summit a success. Thank you very much. Well, Your Excellency, thank you uh, so much. Uh, regrettably, we have time for just a couple of uh, questions. Uh, we've heard uh, this morning from the Prime Minister, and I do think all uh, contributors, about the great success over the last 15 years of two-way trade between our nations. The, the question really is, do you see that trade go growth continuing in light of the economic uh, situation in China? As I indicated in my speech, um, we do see uh, great potential and vast room for further growth in our bilateral trade. Of course, we have already achieved the major uh, milestone of $40 billion last year. But if I remember correctly, right in this room, uh, when the business communities of the two countries got together towards the end of the last year, uh, there was a lot of conversation of setting our collective sites on the next milestone, which is adding the next 10 billion and making it uh, 50 billion by 2030. And I think there is a lot that would support uh, such an outlook, uh, uh, starting with the traditional uh, sectors. Uh, there is still further room for growth. Uh, and I think yesterday, uh, during the reception, I talked with some of the uh, business leaders and uh, I understand there will be several trade delegations in September going to China. And one of the trade delegations uh, composed of some of the major uh, leaders of the major uh, consumer products or produce companies uh, in New Zealand will go to the western part of China. Of course, uh, uh, the businesses, the New Zealand businesses have started uh, establishing them themselves uh, in, on the eastern seaboard, which is more uh, developed economically. So, but the, the vast western part of the country is largely undeveloped as far as New Zealand businesses are concerned. So that represents great potential because uh, that is uh, the new growth areas in China. But apart from these traditional sectors, uh, um, during the Prime Minister's visit uh, and uh, at the discussions uh, at the business level as well, uh, there's, I think, a lot of discussion about going or diversifying into some of the new areas, uh, like uh, e-mobility, like uh, other aspects of sustainability, uh, like, new, uh, like new energy and like uh, resilient uh, infrastructure. So, uh, these are areas uh, uh, that has 
just started uh, and they represent further uh, potential, uh, uh, I think, uh, for uh, our economic uh, already uh, productive and mutually beneficial and strong uh, economic partnership. Well, but you're I think, but yeah, more importantly, uh, because uh, I think uh, there's, there's a mutually supportive relationship between what happens on the economic front and the state of the overall relationship. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, economic cooperation is a major pillar of our relationship. But I think it works the other way around as well because a good, strong uh, uh, overall relationship also underpins the further growth uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, our economic relations. And for that reason, I remain uh, confident that uh, uh, the outlook of our economic relationship, in particularly on trade, uh, remains very bright. Thank you. And finally, Your Excellency, we've heard a lot about CPTPP. Um, why does China want to join? And you've heard from the ministers about the high standards. Is China prepared to make some of the tough decisions to meet those high standards? Mm. Thank you for bringing up that question. We have decided to apply for membership of CPTPP uh, because it is well aligned with what we've been doing uh, over the years with our economy. That is to uh, opening up further uh, to the rest of the world on one hand, and on the other, uh, deepening uh, the reform uh, the domestic reform process. There, these two aspects are mutually uh, supportive. And, and as part of that strategy, um, we have uh, set out to establish a network of high standard, what we call a, high st a network of high standard free trade arrangements. Uh, it, that includes uh, the recently upgraded bilateral uh, FTA between New Zealand and China. That also includes uh, uh, the, the upgraded uh, uh, FTA between China and ASEAN, for example, and that also uh, applies to uh, RCEP, uh, the, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. And uh, uh, CPPTPP um, uh, is important uh, for us, uh, not because uh, it'll be easy, but exactly because it will be difficult and tough. Because uh, CPTPP has been widely acclaimed as the gold standard uh, FTA of the 21st century, uh, setting some of the highest standards in this world in a lot of important areas concerning trade. And uh, we are determined to align ourselves with those standards uh, uh, and uh, to as, as an impetus to our opening up process as an impetus to uh, the domestic uh, reforms we're going to undertake anyway. And um, we're glad uh, that uh, the uh, UK accession process uh, is now complete. Uh, I understand that the, uh, um, the T CPTPP members are ready to take the next steps now and I heard from the two ministers that uh, uh, the focus right now is on the review to keep uh, the agreement up to date. Uh, but hopefully, at the same time, uh, 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 we could start a process or processes on uh, the applications of China and some of the other uh, aspirants as well. Uh, and uh, for New Zealand, as I see it, for the CPTPP uh, to, uh, to remain a leader in this world in terms of uh, uh, opening up uh, for freer trade, uh, I think it is important not only to be updated, but also to keep its door open. Uh, and the accession of China uh, will bring uh, significant benefits, uh, not only to China, as I've indicated, but also to uh, the existing members of CPTPP and the rest of the world. Because uh, once China is in, 
the number of consumers uh, for CPTPP members will triple. And the overall uh, economy of CPTPP membership will expand by 150%. So that uh, will potentially bring significant benefits, uh, I think, uh, again, to not only the uh, current members, but to the rest of the world as, as well. So uh, uh, hopefully, and I don't see any conflict between these two processes, is spending in terms of membership and reviewing to keep it up, update. And we look forward to uh, the discussions that will inevitably have to take place to prepare the ground for furthering work uh, on the process. Well, Dr. Wang, thank you very much for your contribution, your remarks uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you.